So let's go ahead and first go through the key physical exam features and facies that you will see in your physical exam on the USMLE. Here we go. So patients with Down syndrome are going to have this flat nasal bridge. They're going to have prominent epicanthal folds. That's going to be right near the nose and near the eye flaps. They're going to have low set ears. They're also going to have abnormalities in the eye, specifically the colored portion of the eye. And we call those brush field spots. Patients with trisomy 21 are going to have a single palmar crease and on their toes, their first and second digits may actually be very widely spaced. So let's go ahead and integrate this. We see the flat nasal fold. We are going to see the prominent epicanthal folds right here. And we are going to see those low set ears related to trisomy 21. This picture right here is going to be representative of the single palmar crease. This is going to be that gap that you see in between the toes known as a sandal gap toes. And then these are going to be the speckled portions of the colored portion of the eye. And that is going to be known as the brush field spot. So let's go through some high yield vignettes for Down syndrome. Question-based manner, here we go. A child with trisomy 21 with echo showing atrioventricular valve regurgitation. So atrio and ventricular. What do you think is the diagnosis here? Well, this is going to be representative of the endocardial cushion defects that is related to Down syndrome. So let's just tie in and integrate some USMLE cardiac embryology. Remember that the endocardial cushion, which is right here, and I'm going to point the arrow right there, is going to form the basis for your valves. Okay. And so when you are going to have abnormal endocardial cushions, you are going to have abnormalities in the valve such that you don't have great valves and you have atrioventricular valve regurgitation, i.e. now you have a common chamber known as an AV canal defect that is going to be mixing blue and red blood together and downstream going to present as low pulse ox on your vital signs in your USMLE question. And so that is very important for us to know is that one of the cardiac defects related to Down syndrome is going to be the endocardial cushion defects. Let's go ahead and keep going. A newborn child with trisomy 21 who has not passed stool since birth has abdominal distension. What are we worried about here? So we have a newborn, they haven't passed stool, which that means that they haven't passed what is the first stool known as meconium. And so in this scenario, you are going to be worried about Hirschsprung's disease. Now, Hirschsprung's disease is going to be due to what mechanism? And that is a failure of migration of the hour box myenteric plexus. And the US really loves to test this mechanism. Why? Because there's a histological integration, which we're going to get to. Now, let's transition this vignette and we say, ah, same newborn baby, but actually rather than Down syndrome, they have cystic fibrosis. And now they can't pass this first stool. What are you worried about here now? Hmm. Well, cystic fibrosis and failure to pass meconium, you're going to associate something known as meconium ileus. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about cystic fibrosis later on in this webinar. However, I want you to recognize that failure to pass meconium has three major differentials. A, you're going to have an anatomic defect, something like anal atresia. B, you're going to have a lack of the Auerbach's myenteric plexus. And so that is going to be uh, related to Hirschsprung's disease. Or C, you're going to have a thick, thick mucus plug at your terminal ileum sequel junction. And that's going to be characteristic of meconium ileus. So let's just do a quick histology integration. And that is understanding where is the my myenteric plexus. And the Auerbach myenteric plexus is right here. It is going to be in between the inner circular and outer longitudinal muscle. And what we notice when we have a patient who has no inner circular outer longitudinal muscle is that these patients are not going to have good peristalsis of poop throughout the GI tract. What happens is that you end up having a dilation of the colon because there is backup. And at this transition point, you recognize that there is no myenteric plexus 
And thus the patient is going to have backup of the poop and they're not going to be able to have meconium going forward. And so that's why the diagnostic test is a rectal suction biopsy, because we take a suction piece of the colon and we look at it under a microscope and we say, hey, is there a plexus? Is there a ganglion in between the inner circular and outer longitudinal muscle? Because remember, embryologically, and the USMLE loves for you to know this, is that typically you have a myenteric plexus migration from proximal to distal. And so the failure of the migration of those neural crest cells is going to be the pathophysiologic basis of Hirschsprung's disease. So let's continue and talk about Down syndrome. Here, I'm going to give you an x-ray and this x-ray shows that there is two air-filled cavities. Now, as a flip the classroom moment, go ahead and put in the chat. Do you think that this patient with Down syndrome and this x-ray are they going to have bilious or non-bilious emesis? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Do you think they're going to have bilious or non-bilious emesis when you see this specific abdominal film? Awesome. And if you're saying that this is duodenal atresia, you're absolutely correct. Now, what is the likely mechanism when it comes to duodenal atresia? Well, it is the failure of the endodermal gut tube to recanalize. Remember that you start with this cylindrical tube and canalization is basically making a hole, making it into a hollow cylinder. And if that process is going to be messed up, you can have what we call duodenal atresia or the duodenum doesn't develop. So now let's go ahead and talk about this specific pathology. A patient with trisomy 21 has bilious emesis. Maybe they have the same KUB or abdominal film. And now you note that there is external gut tube compression. Hmm. So similar presentation to duodenal atresia with the bilious emesis, but now you're saying that there is external gut tube compression. And so if you are thinking annular pancreas, you're absolutely correct. Remember in annular pancreas, what ends up happening is that the ventral and dorsal bud of the pancreas does not mig do not migrate and fuse properly. In fact, what they do is they form an annulus, which means ring surrounding the duodenum, and you end up having the similar presentation as duodenal atresia. And so remember that annular pancreas associated with Down syndrome as well, it is an external compression of the duodenum because there is a failure of the dorsal and ventral bud of the pancreas to fuse. Now let's go ahead and break down Down syndrome in a systems-based manner. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are learning a lot right now, go ahead and type in yes into the chat box just so that I know you're paying attention. Excellent, wow. Look how many people are active and engaged. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your attention. Cardiology, we talked about the atrioventricular septal defects or what we call the endocardial cushion defects. You also are going to have membranous VSDs. You're gonna have an ostium primum ASD, very important, okay? From a GI standpoint, you're gonna be thinking about duodenal atresia, remember double bubble and the bilious emesis, annular pancreas, as well as Hirschsprung's disease. Now, from an endocrine standpoint, think about patients with trisomy 21 as very autoimmune. What does that mean? Well, they may have a predilection to becoming hypothyroid. They may have a predilection to develop type one diabetes. And how does type one diabetes present on the USMLE? as DKA usually. From a neurological standpoint, what do patients with Down syndrome have a predilection to? Well, they have a propensity to having early onset Alzheimer's, specifically around the age of 40. And why is that? Well, what ends up happening is that if you go back to normal neural processes, you have something known as the amyloid precursor protein. And that amyloid precursor protein is on chromosome 21. Now I'm gonna describe to you normal right now. And what you notice is that the amyloid precursor protein can undergo alpha secretase or cleavage or beta cleavage, all right? And so what happens is that when you have excess amounts of beta cleavage with the amyloid precursor protein, you can end up having in the brain A beta plaques that form. And remember that A beta plaques are the hallmark pathology, microscopic pathology for Alzheimer's disease.
And so patients who are going to have three copies of chromosome 21 are going to have three copies of APP and are going to have more likelihood to undergo beta cleavage and subsequently develop a beta plaques. All right, very good. So let's go ahead and go through the respiratory tie-ins. From a respiratory standpoint, patients with trisomy 21 are going to be very hypotonic. And as a future pediatric critical care physician, this is something that I really need to worry about when I'm managing the airway of a child with Down syndrome. Another thing that I have to worry about is their large tongue, such that if I have to secure their airway, I need to make sure that I take into account their excess pharyngeal tissue, as well as the airway hypotonia. Now, over time, these patients who have such bad airway hypotonia are going to have obstructive sleep apnea. And remember that when you have obstruction in your lungs, the vasculature is going to suffer. And why is that? Well, if you have obstruction, i.e. this alveoli clamps down, your P big A CO2 is going to go up. And as a result, you end up developing hypoxemia because you're unable to take that bad gas out. Well, what happens is that then the capillary right at the alveolar capillary interface is going to vasoconstrict because there's a physiologic process in the lung known as hypoxic vasoconstriction. And that hypoxic vasoconstriction over time is going to create pulmonary hypertension and increase right ventricular afterload because remember, right ventricle is going to pump blood into the lungs and subsequently you're going to get RV failure known as core pulmonale. How are patients going to present? They're going to present if they're older as JVD, they're going to present with hepatomegaly, maybe some peripheral edema. And remember, they're going to have clear, uh, clear lung sounds. And that kind of differentiates left heart failure from right heart failure. And remember, how does heart failure present in kids? Well, heart failure in kids is going to present as not growing well. They're going to have tachypnea with feeding. They're going to be sweating a lot. Why? Because their heart is causing a hypermetabolic state. All right, Down syndrome continued from a hemonc standpoint. The questions you have to watch out for are early onset leukemia. Either you're talking about the M3 AML, which is, or uh, excuse me, acute megakaryoblastic a uh, leukemia or AML, or you're going to be thinking about ALL. And remember that leukemia typically on your USMLE presents as pancytopenia because the leukemia takes over the bone marrow or it presents as a very, very high white count. And what you have to do is you have to differentiate whether this high white count is going to be due to infection, what we call a leukemoid reaction, or whether or not this is going to be due to some sort of leukemia. Finally, from an MSK standpoint, you want to recognize not only the muscle hypotonia, but the atlantoaxial instability. And remember that the atlas and axis are going to be your upper cervical vertebrae. And what happens is that this atlantoaxial ligament is going to be very, very loose, such that when you are going to have hyperextension of the neck, if you have very bad atlantoaxial instability, you could sever the upper cervical spinal cords, and that could be very life-threatening. And so this is important for us to recognize, not only in Down syndrome patients, but in patients who are going to have weakness of that atlantoaxial ligament. And those are going to be patients who have, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. They are going to have such inflammation of their connective tissues that they could also present with atlantoaxial instability.